This week at the Internet Cafe, censorship on the net. The Church of Scientology has a huge website, but they're suing several people trying to stop them from posting certain information about the church. This is Keith Henson. He's one of the guys being sued by the church. He's claiming free speech on the net. Some people in England are saying nasty things about McDonald's on the web, and the fast food chain is suing, trying to stop them. And some websites like Annoy.com are saying outrageous things just to challenge censorship on the net and test the limits of free speech in cyberspace. Plus, in this week's Cyber Blast segment, we'll send you several programs to control access to the net, including Cyber Patrol, Cyber Sitter, and Net Nanny. Censorship on the net, this week at the Internet Cafe. The Internet Cafe is made possible in part by Intel. One innovative idea always leads to another. Now there are connected CD-ROMs that link rich multimedia with related information on the Internet. The connected CD-ROMs, it's the Intel Pentium processor. Hi, and welcome to the Internet Cafe. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Jane Wither is off tonight. Andrew DeVries is here with me. It's Cyber Smith in Palo Alto. And a really interesting show tonight. We're talking about censorship on the net and some really interesting characters we're going to be talking to here. Now, you're, you're going to be talking to a guy involved in this so-called McLeibel case. What's that about? Well, there was a group of activists in England who uh, produced a pamphlet that said some things about McDonald's that they felt were true. McDonald's didn't agree with them and decided to take them to court. Uh -huh. What it turned out, it became the longest libel suit in the history of the courts. It's been, I think, 313 days they've been in court. <laughs> And groups that have been supporting them created a website, the McLibel website, right. to you know chronicle the events, help support them, and show what's going on in the court. It's been accessed over seven million wow. times. So, so these people were saying there were bad things going on at McDonald's. Exactly, the they were talking whatever. about environmental issues, and yeah. they were talking about health issues that you know claims that McDonald's had made that they said weren't true. And this website has kind of exploded in, in McDonald's face, yeah. in a sense, because now it's a worldwide global issue. So in this issue. context of censorship on the web, I mean, this is the problem where anybody can be honest with anything bad they want about anybody. And how do you defend against that? And should you control that, et cetera, et cetera? Potentially. I'm talking to guys from the Church of Scientology, and this is really complicated. Yeah, There's boy. a war going on between the Scientologists and the netizens over censorship. They each seem to be on both sides of the issue. It's going to be very interesting tonight. Censorship on the net tonight at the Internet Cafe. Now, Keith, as a member of Food Not Bombs uh, and one of the founders, actually, you're, you're no stranger to uh, censorship or attempts to, to censor um, sort of activist movements and, uh, and, and corporations and governments stepping in. Right now, there's this uh, case going on in England um, that's been dubbed the McLibel case involving McDonald's and some activists there um, that has sort of taken flight on the web. What, what's that all about? Well, what happened is the people at uh, London Greenpeace, which is different than Greenpeace that people not normally, related, to right? That. They they were handing out flyers on the environmental destruction caused by the McDonald's Corporation in, and, in England, in England, okay. outside of a local McDonald's in London, and the London office and, and McDonald's UK took those people to court and and charged them with libeling the corporation uh -huh. by handing out misinformation on these flyers. Now I've heard that in especially like in England there's a, a lot of uh, uh, bias towards corporations when it comes to libel suits so they thought they had it won. Right, basically. they thought they had it won and then what it turned out was that because of the case, uh, Helen and David, who are the ones that have been trying the case for the last 300 the activists, days. They're acting as their own lawyers. Right, they're their own lawyers. In fact, you're not allowed to ha bring in a, your own uh, lawyer for this oh, kind really? of a, a situation, apparently, okay. in London. They have been able to systematically prove that everything on their flyer was true. And as, during this time, they created this thing called the uh, Mixed Spotlight. And they which put, is a website. Which is this website. And they've been putting like the, the day's information of what's gone on in court. Because they go in like five days a week. Right. I went there to visit them and, uh, and went and spent a day in court with David and Helen and saw how crazy it all was. And then um, you were able to see, like for yourself, if you just go to the uh, mixed spotlight, um, what happened that day in the case. And then now the closing arguments of the uh, McDonald's Corporation, which they actually submitted in writing instead of saying verbally. And what, why did they do that? They were hoping to conceal what their real uh, motives were in their um, suing. Helen and David, and, and make it not backfire. Make it not easily accessible to the media and things like right. that. So right. So now the media, the general public, can just go to this website and read all 500 pages. Oh, themselves. they actually put them up on. They the put site. the whole thing up on the site. So you can also get information like about. You can get the actual flyers if you want and download them 
and uh, from the flyers, the original flyers, the ones that, they that were got them in out. trouble. Oh, okay. Right. So then now, all over the world, people are handing out these flyers off this website. And in October, there are protests in like um, Australia, New Zealand, all over Europe, and the U.S. and Canada. Now that and brings up a point. Actually, if, if if you can now go up on the site and actually get the flyer, has McDonald's an attempted to shut down this website as well, or they're still actually just still trying the the original case? They're just trying the original case, and seven million people have. Uh, have contacted and read the website uh, during the 12 months. It's now seven million. Seven so it million. Really, <laughs> it's totally hurt McDonald's right. completely. Much more than going, a few flyers would have uh, in front of you. You couldn't hand out flyers. Although, as a result, now be people have downloaded these flyers and are standing outside of their local McDonald's handing them out, and the message is meeting just literally millions more, and millions more of people. people. Now, you mentioned the global perspective of this. Now people are able to organize more. Do you feel that that's been a big impact of oh, this? Oh, it's really helped Food Not Bombs. When I was in uh, Nottingham, England, they uh, were on the mixed spotlight, and they showed me how Food Not Bombs had been sharing vegetarian food in Australia, and uh, that there was these other actions all over the world. And you can just go and, and on the website and access that um, location. And you can see people organizing demonstrations, nonviolent protests for animal rights, for uh, human rights, against uh, war and poverty, all on this website. And so it's, it's basically amazing. taking you know, what has been more community-based activism and in a sense organize it or giving it an organizing tool to, to take it one step further. Right, and it's very important when the corporations span the globe and, the, and there's the new uh, uh, World Trade Organization, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and so on, that kind of economic policy and its global reach and the fact that it takes uh, democracy away from people around the world is now being organized uh, against by using the internet. Great, great. Well, thank yeah. you. Very interesting. Thank you. A friend of mine from Holland has colon cancer and right before he went into the operation um, they told him that maybe a result of the operation would be that he would be impotent. And so he went online and talked with other people uh, who had had the same kind of thing and he could talk about things but if there was censorship it would mean that he couldn't talk about a lot of things which I can't even mention on TV because uh, it would be censored and the weird thing is just that censorship is equating sexuality with pornography and it's not it's that's very dangerous and it's taking a lot of rights away from patients so. Jeff we're talking about censorship on the net here and you guys that is the Church of Scientology uh, are seen by many people on the net as attempting to censor people on the internet, stopping people from publishing certain documents, stopping people from posting things in, in news groups about the church. Explain what it is that you don't like about what's going on and why you're filing these lawsuits against people for publishing stuff on the net. In the first place, the Church of Scientology is very interested in people understanding what it is. We publish lots of books, tapes, films about Scientology. We have one of the largest uh, internet websites. It's uh, out there. It's like 30,000 pages. Um, we, what we're very concerned with is, is people uh, abusing our intellectual property rights, taking taking things that. How, can, how are they doing that? They're taking copyrighted materials, uh, sacred scriptures to the church, and publishing them on the internet. Now it's hard to understand as a church, as a religion, why you would care that people are going to publish sacred text. I mean, it's hard to imagine another church complaining that somebody published a portion of the Bible or something like that. Why do you care about that? Well, almost everything in Scientology is, is open to the public and available to the public, and we want the public to read it. A very small percentage of, uh, of Scientology's scriptures are considered sacred and, and uh, only for people after they've done certain levels of, of advanced spiritual training. A lot of religions have the same kind of, kind of thing. Um, it's those things we're trying to protect, and that's why we've uh, we've copyrighted them, and that's why we've gone after people who have attempted to. No, I, I think in some of your lawsuits, you you've referred to these things as trade secrets, and again, it's hard for people to understand why a church has trade secrets. It sounds like a competitive business is concerned mm -hmm. about that. So again, explain that. Why why does a church have trade secrets that you care about? Well, unfortunately, trade secrets and copyrights are the only laws that uh, that afford any protection to the to the church at all. We we find ourselves a religion in a secular environment, and those are the only laws that apply. All right. Now, there's other things that people accuse the church of uh, spamming, which is of course a no no on the net. Uh, there's the talk about the cancel bunny. I mean, people from the church supposedly going on and illegally unposting postings that have gone on which are critical of the church. What's your answer to those criticisms? Well, there, there are 8 million Scientologists around the world, and I, and I can't speak for all of them. Uh, none of those things that have, that have happened or any official uh, actions of the church 
there, there could have been some zealous Scientologists doing some of those things. Would you say this is not really a church position? No, not at all. Church endorsed activity. We're t we've taken our position to the courts, and that's where we're fighting our battle. All right. Now, what's really interesting about the church's position here is you are attempting to stop some people from saying things uh, which you don't like or are critical of the church or dealing with documents you don't think they should talk about. Yet, on the other hand, the church is upset because the government of Germany is sort of trying to do the same thing to you and stop you from saying things because you guys are very critical of the German government. So how do you, aren't you on both sides of the issue here? Not really. The, the situation in Germany is, is actually pretty horrifying. They're, they're uh, discriminating against Scientologists like they did against the Jews in the 1930s. Not just Scientologists, but Muslims, Seventh-day Adventists, and a number of other minority religions. Uh, you can't get a bank account in Germany if you're a Scientologist. You can't be a member of a political party if you're a Scientologist. can't hold public office. Kids can't attend schools. It's a very scary situation. And we've been trying, we've been going to the international media uh, to let them know about it. The Germans are very upset that we've taken this battle public. So, I mean, is this, in this issue of censorship, does it depend on whether they're saying good things or bad things in a sense? I mean, the German, you say bad things about the Germans, they want to stop you, you don't like that. Critics of the church say bad things about the church, you don't like that, you want to stop them. No, not at all. We've been free speech advocates from day one. The Church of Scientology was, was one of the foremost uh, uh, pioneers of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we published a booklet about how to use the Freedom of Information Act. We are, we're First Amendment pioneers. So did, didn't you sue the Washington Post and try to get them to stop publishing some of these documents? That's true. The just those copyrighted materials of the church. For for uh, all religion Scientology mentioned the Usenet group. Uh, for three years, people published critical things of the church, and we never said a thing about it. Nothing happened. It wasn't until they began publishing without a permission those copyrighted materials that they had any trouble with us at all. The complicated issue, Jeff. Thanks for explaining. Thank it. you. All right, Keith, I just spoke to this guy from the Church of Scientology, and he says this is not an issue uh, why they're suing you. is not because uh, they're not trying to censor you. They're not trying to censor the net. You have stolen their intellectual property. It's a copyright. It's a, it's a trade secret issue. Now, 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 before we get to the conclusions, what have you done that's gotten them, them so upset that they want to sue you? I posted one of their criminal instruction manuals in the context of a letter to the judge in another case. Which said what? Well, the letter, the, the thing that, that they had is an instruction manual on how to use a thing called an e-meter to cure physical illnesses. And that's illegal. It's not legal to propose to people that you're going to cure their physical problems with basically psychobabble help on them. So you were concerned that they were disseminating inaccurate, if not illegal, information, and you wanted people to know about this. Right. Not only was it Ill illegal for them to do it, but they were actually under a court order in, from the uh, 1970s by Judge Gassell saying that they just flat couldn't do this, and they were, they're doing it. Okay. Given that maybe what you're saying is true, if this was stuff sort of lifted out from one of their copyrighted books, didn't you nevertheless steal something they owned? It's called fair use. And in particular, it's fair use in the public interest in this particular case, because I'm not doing it for any profit, obviously. I mean, there's clearly, this is only amusement to me. Yeah. But it is, a, it is a matter that fair use is involved here, and it was, what, a page or less out of a three or 400 pages worth of material that they copyrighted as one lump. It was called Knots 34, and they're pretty actually, they do a lot of stuff which is illegal medical uh, type of things, not only with... Uh, with their pseudo-psychiatry that they do on people, but they actually have a number of techniques that they call, for example, another one is, is called the introspection rundown, where they flat lock somebody up who's acting psychotic and leave them there and as long as it's ne necessary, which might be months. They've had, had some people locked up for months. All right, now, now and a you, woman died from this, by the way. Yeah. You said for you, now this is amusement. These guys apparently take this very seriously. They say, hey, there's been criticism of Scientology all over the place. It's been on the net. They didn't stop, try to stop anybody from talking. Oh, they tried. Their lawyer attempted to remove the entire group. She had an, an RM group. The all-religion Scientology? She tried to wreck the whole thing. How did she do that? They issued a remove group. It's a control message that causes the entire thing to be deleted all over the whole world. 
it didn't work because a lot of people have it have it turned have that feature turned off in their news machines but it could have done it um, and it did actually wipe a number of people out is there all of a sudden the news group disappeared mm -hmm. they've also tried extensively to spam the thing out of existence they put over a hundred thousand spam messages that they cut from their uh, material called what is Scientology mm -hmm. onto the net they finally quit doing it and you know why because they flat ran out of any place to put it into the net. Uh, now, what was the cancel bunny story? Going in and trying to ah, undo messages? Right, and that was another case. In fact, I had one of my messages canceled. I quoted six lines, six quotes deep on it. I quoted five or six lines of one of their material, clearly within uh, fair use. It's about telepathically communicating with plants and animals in a zoo. And they canceled that and, and sent me a warning letter on it, which I posted on the, uh, on the bulletin board. Now, going back to the issue of censorship, it seems to me the church is in a weird position because they're saying lots of nasty things about the government of Germany right now, and the German government is giving them a hard time in return. That, they're saying, they don't like somebody trying to limit their criticism. You, you think they're on both sides of the issue on censorship here? Well, of course. They, they are mostly on the interest of making money so that they can feed it into getting more people, sucking more people into their craziness. It's a mimetic infection. An idea that uh, it's sort of like computer viruses applied to human beings. If you look up the word meme on the net, you'll find uh, an awful lot of material on this particular topic. All right. I, you know, you're not a former church member, are you? No. You just um, don't like what they're doing. No, my actually, most of my interest in it is theoretical because I've done a lot of work about it with infectious information. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've, in fact, written quite a few articles on it. All right. Well, the lawsuit's still going on, so. Oh, it'll go on for we'll see who wins. a long time. Keith, it's thanks a lot. Of a lot. Fun. Thank you. On this Cyber Blast, we're going to send you six software programs. We'll be downloading to you more than four megabytes of code in less than 120 seconds. You can actually see the data downloading right now. To get these files this fast through the TV signal, you need an add-on card for your computer called a TV modem. You can also download these files through our website using your regular telephone modem. Download time on the phone at 28.8 will be about half an hour. Let me tell you what we're sending you. First of all, the two most popular programs to manage what your children see on the net. We're sending you Cyber Sitter and Net Nanny. With each, you can set up certain parameters by content or URL, and the program will then block access to those particular sites. The third program we're sending you is called Cyber Patrol. This software lets you monitor use of the net, either by children or employees. It provides a log of net use, sites accessed, and it lets you set time limits on how much overall net use is allowed. We're also sending you two programs to help you manage information on the net. These are the Internet Filter and InfoScan. InfoScan helps you manage news groups and list servers and makes it easier to find what you want. Internet Filter is a similar program that lets you set a series of filters to manage the incoming information from the net. Finally, we're sending you a program called Triple Exposure. It helps you know what other people are doing with your computer, and it can provide alerts if questionable use occurs. Remember, we're sending all six programs to you right now through the television signal using our Cyber Blast technology. The speed of this download is more than 300K. If you need information on how to receive a Cyber Blast or on how to install a TV modem, just check out the Internet Cafe section of our website at PCTV.com. You'll also find information there on how to download these files directly from the net using a telephone modem. So the download is just about complete. Have fun with your new software. That wraps up this Cyber Blast on the Internet Cafe. I'm Laurie Anderson. So Clinton, you uh, have created a site called uh, Annoy.com, and I'm wondering sort of how, how that came about. Um, well, from a personal standpoint, um, it was a, a response to, you know, I'm originally South African, and um, I grew up in South Africa and left South Africa at a time where you could be imprisoned for quoting. Just, 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 just quoting. Quoting somebody. Nelson Mandela, who's now the president, for right. example. You would be jailed or tried or something. Yeah, charged it was for it was, yeah. was it was illegal. Right. And so, um, I, you know, when I took on the decision to become an American, it was one that I took very seriously. And you became a citizen. I became a citizen. Okay. It's not an easy, you know, task to become an American mm -hmm. citizen. You've got to go and jump through hoops. Right. But uh, you know, the First Amendment was something that I I valued very much. And when I became an American, I. You know, I took an oath that I would defend the Constitution, and so including I'm the First that. Amendment and everything that comes with it. And so I'm doing that with Annoy.com, which is illegal. 
it's operating illegally. And how do you mean illegal? What's the law that's, that you're... The Communications Decency oh, Act okay. stipulates that um, any information or any, any content that's transmitted that is indecent, whatever that means, Very exactly, broad description. With an intent to annoy. Which is even broader, annoy. Yeah. yeah. So we're actually challenging the annoy provision, which is separate and distinct from uh, the current challenge that's that's before the Supreme Court, in fact. So now you've created this site, annoy.com, annoy the intent to annoy. Tell me, what, what are you going to find up there that uh, that will allow people to, to well, annoy, or basically to challenge what's going on? Well, it's annoying in the sense that it deals with issues of the day in a very provocative way, whether it's you know, gun control, same-sex marriage, environmental issues, race issues. And not only does it prevent that, present them in a very subjective way, but it provides mechanisms that allow people to then do something about it. So whether it's, um, you know, reading an article on, on the environment and then being able to send anonymous emails to Bill Clinton oh, okay. or to, you know, using a, um, like a Mad Lib, which is, you know, you a drop down. Well, like an ad lib, where you actually have a story or a, a form letter, and you get to choose the words that shape what's actually being said. Exactly, okay. which may include indecent language, or the, what some people in some communities might consider indecent. And then you can send that email to the people. You can that send you... that to the to the person, people that are selected anonymously. Oh, okay. Which so is the which is key, because right. some people aren't able to do it, to take that kind of a risk to communicate something that they really feel strongly about. Because they may risk their job if it's a you know Dow Forning employee talking about breast implants or if it it's a gay service. It may be too much member. too much of a risk. Yeah, you, you're also mentioning if you're a gay in the military that you wouldn't want to just come right out and say it. Exactly, and this you is can't. an avenue for you to do that. So, what are some of the other things that that uh, you there's can a jibe, annoy on there as well? There's, there's a there's a job section which is like a threaded message format. And the what does that mean, threaded message? Um, you, you can discuss oh, just the different topics the different. and then someone else can come and like, say, oh, I completely agree with you or I don't, or, but what about this? So it's just so an it's ongoing a really an, conversation. An, a really. platform for, for that kind of discussion. Absolutely, and we don't censor those boards. So those are, you know, what people say or what people say. That's what people talk about. Right. You know, we can sweep it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist, or we can say, can, this is what people are talking about, maybe let's listen. Right, and you're not monitoring it in any sense as far as kicking people off who may be going too far or we really don't want to right. say too far, <laughs> basically. Right. You know, I mean, you know, at this point, no. It's, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great tool, and the, the quality of the conversation is amazing. And then there's a, the ability to send anonymous postcards as well, which is a, another fun element in the site. Now, are these visual graphic postcards? Very much so. And are they very annoying or very amusing, depending, again, on what kind of a mood you're in? Well, I'm going to have to <laughs> check out annoy.com. Thank you, Clint. Please do, sure. It's kind of interesting, you know, when people talk about censorship on the net, the, the uh, environment is usually sex and kids mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff, but we've seen it's a far more complex, far broader issue than just that, isn't it? Right. Well, we heard a little bit about the Communications Decency Act and sort of the government's way to try, to, right, to, try to regulate the Internet. And, and what the problem with that terminology that they're using in that proposed law is that it is so broad in a sense. You know, there's not only is it graphic or pornographic, anything that annoys somebody. Well, that's the problem with any speech regulation. How do you define it and, and who makes those decisions? Right. Now, what about the corporate? stuff though I mean you saw the McDonald's situation after hearing all of this I mean do you believe First Amendment period absolutely on the net yes I do I think this is one of the first times in history where there has been a, a communications vehicle that that hasn't been you know controlled by just large corporations and I think corporations are very scared right now it's uh, it, they don't really know what to do and I think it's great that people are able to now have the accessibility to to use that vehicle for communication as well so yeah I, I think the default has to be First Amendment rights say what you want I mean I'd rather I as a parent or I, it's very easy right. to turn off a page on the net. You exactly. know, nobody has to force me to exactly. read anything. So I, I'd rather control it myself and have some agency, some government, some person say, this is good for you, this is bad for you. 
With the understanding that even in free speech, you can't yell fire in a theater, you can't slander people and that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. It's not an easy topic. No. Well, so we've been talking about censorship on the net. We'll see you here again next week at the Internet Cafe. The Internet Cafe is made possible in part by Intel. One innovative idea always leads to another. Now there are connected CD-ROMs that link rich multimedia with related information on the Internet. The connected CD-ROMs, it's the Intel Pentium processor. Videotapes of the Internet Cafe are available for $24.95 each. To order your copy, call 1-800-916-PCTV. We'll help you stay on top of the rapidly changing world of computers and personal technology. Call today for your copy of this episode of the Internet Cafe or any of our other award-winning programs. When ordering, please ask for tapes by show number and title. That's 1-800-916-PCTV.